Welcome back, Lemonster, and thanks for tuning in. Uh, I am your state representative, Natalie Higgins. This is Representing Lemonster, my monthly uh, access TV show to help you get to know your local elected officials. I'm really excited to be here with Pauline Cormier, your newest member to the city council in Lemonster. And also, after the break, we're going to be joined by now former state senator, Jen Flanagan, uh, one of my mentors, and I'm just really excited that we could get her on as she's transitioning to the Cannabis Control Commission. So, Pauline, thank you so much for joining me today. And it's been how many months since you've been on the city council? Oh, it's been a few months <laughs> It's now. been a few months. You're getting your feet getting on the ground. Getting my feet wet, getting, um, uh, getting you know, right into the, the heart of some very tough topics right off the bat. Yeah, you entered but, right in the middle of budget season, which is never an easy time to just hop in. Right, I, and I learned that fairly quickly. A uh, lot of hours, uh, a big learning curve, mm -hmm. but I have to say that everybody on the uh, committee has been fantastic and helped me along and, and you know, gave me a little extra guidance that yeah. I was looking for. But. And we got through it. And you had a great model with Wayne Nickel. I mean, he just was so dedicated to the, the people in board too. And I'm so excited to see you follow in his footsteps. And I know that you're going to do him very proud. Uh, and that board two is really, really lucky to have you. I had the privilege of having you come to uh, some senior coffee hours with me and really chat about what's going on, kind of other ways that folks can get involved. And have there been any issues that surprised you? Uh, not really surprised. It's a lot of the same issues I think that we've had in Ward 2 right along. Mm -hmm. um, you know, people are really good giving me their opinions. A lot of it centers around there's always a noise issue. Right. Especially on the, you know, in the French Hill section where there's a lot of people in a small area and we're mm -hmm. all kind of on top of each other. Yeah. Um, so that comes up quite often. The traffic concerns. Mm -hmm. But I think it's the same concerns that go on throughout the city. Right. Um, so it's, it's a lot of listening and doing a lot of research about what we can do, how mm -hmm. we can start to fix some of these problems and ease some of the burden on the, the neighbors who've been there forever right. and who are having a difficult time enjoying their property now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's a lot of research and seeing what we can do and a lot of listening. Um, I know Wayne had his hands full. And it's, and it's been a lot to try to fill his shoes. And I, and I don't expect that yeah. I'm going to do that anytime soon. But I'm trying. I'm yeah, trying. yeah. And I mean, we have been getting so many constituent calls this week. I don't know what's going on. But we're going to hear them from a lot of people. And I'm really excited. I guess what we're doing is working. But it's been interesting to see kind of we get a lot of the local, really, really local city stuff. And we get a lot of the federal stuff, too. So it's a great way for me to build relationships with all of you on the city council, with our congressman, with our senator, um, to really figure out kind of how can we work together because a lot of these issues are kind of interwoven. There's issues with roads, and a lot of that comes down to state funding, but then making sure at the city level that there's a plan to making sure that all of the roads and all of the parts of the city are getting repaired at the right time. And, you know, I can't thank you enough. The, the times that we've been able to get together mm -hmm. and sit down and have some really good discussions, the, uh, the coffee hour that we've mm -hmm. had over at La Pierre East that I've been able to join in, it's great. It, it's great that you're so involved in the community, in the local community here. And it's great that it gives me an, uh, the opportunity to be there with you mm -hmm. and have a little more insight. And I think we've been, uh, it's worked out well that we've had to done some, we've been able to do some brainstorming while we're there. Right. And see where you can do, where you can work on your end and yeah. what you'll need from us to help mm -hmm. you mm -hmm. accomplish what you're looking to accomplish and as well. Yeah, and we just had two weeks of community conversations, four different sessions. And I know you're trying to get the neighborhood association kind of restarted and that other, like, we need to get together as a community to talk about the issues we're facing because we're never going to come up with solutions if we don't understand the whole picture of what people are facing. I had, I heard great reviews on the community discussions that you had. Unfortunately, uh, that was my vacation week. So well, it was, I was a lot of people's vacations <laughs> week, and that's why we did the live stream so that we still had the video for folks to be able to tune in later. Yep, that, that it, I, I heard great things about it. And yes, now that you brought it up, is the East Side Association meeting has kind of been, it's, it's always been there. Mm -hmm. It kind of went dormant for a couple of years. Um, so that's something that now that I know that I'm going to be on um, the committee for the next two years, now that, that I have no one running against me, mm -hmm. doesn't mean that I'm going to take it easy, but there are some things that I, I can really start to focus on. 
one of them is getting the East Side Neighborhood Association back in action. Um, and, and to, in the past, it kind of really focused on the French Hill area. Right. But I would like to expand it out so that we're getting all the different parts of Ward 2 involved and actually throughout the city. Mm -hmm. And it'd be nice to have a, a, a meeting once a month to have people come in and be able to invite people like yourself, mm -hmm. have the mayor come in, have the, you know, Ray Racine over with the DPW. And you said like the police chief was the one of the other chief, ideas. The police chief, uh, Chief Goldman has been fantastic. Mm -hmm. He's so receptive. I can call him, get answers, you know, even if he's got to call me back. And it'd be nice to have people to be able to get that kind of information directly from the police chief. Right. Okay, chief, we're having this issue of traffic in this area. What can you do for us? What are you trying to do? So rather than have people just merely have to go through me, mm -hmm. to be able to say, okay, this is going to be our forum. We're going to sit down. We're going to have the chief come in. Right. These are the questions we're going to have to ask him. And if you want some input, come in this day. Mm -hmm. So I'd like to be able to move the, the meetings around a little bit and, and find uh, different spots that are more convenient for people at different areas. Mm -hmm. And uh, those people in the neighborhood that have some accessibility issues, make sure it's a place that they can get into, we can get them transportation. But I would love to see that organization get back on its feet right. and be just an, one more resource for it, not, and not just Ward 2 for the rest of the wards as well. No, I love that model. And you know I love empowering folks in Lemonster to be able to be their own advocates. It's great when we can help get things done, but folks are their own best advocates. And if we can equip them with the tools to be able to make those calls and connect with those folks and feel comfortable calling the police chief or the police department if they have a problem or calling DPW if they're having an issue, if that's the appropriate um, route, but not everyone feels comfortable doing that. So creating those opportunities to connect them and say, okay, well, I know someone who works there. Now it doesn't seem so intimidating to make a call over there. Exactly, and that's a lot of the, uh, and, and you know from talking to people, a lot of them are intimidated to call the police department themselves. And, and they say, well, you know, and a lot of it is, well, I really don't want to bother them right. because of a noise issue or a traffic issue. And, and I know they're working hard and, and they feel like they're putting them out. But in my, con <clears throat> my conversations with the chief and the different department heads is they're saying, no, call us, let us know, because then we can right. put a focus on that area at that certain time. Let them know, and, and, you know, and a lot of people, like I said, they, they call me, which is great. Mm -hmm. And I love taking the phone calls. I love talking to uh, people in the ward. And, and I love forwarding that. But again, I want to be able to take that next step and say, okay, here we have, here's the police chief. He mm -hmm. needs to know. He wants to set up an extra traffic detail or an extra car even for an hour, um, right. a day or a week to say, okay, we've got this going on in this little area. Let's get him focused on it. Let's, mm -hmm. get him, let's get him a priority list. And the only way to do that is to get the people to call in or to come to a meeting so we can set up a priority list. It's one of the things that we're working on with the council right now is the unaccepted streets. And you know, you know yourself, that mm -hmm. comes from the, the state funding. Right. So we need to get it done. I have learned so much from Mark Bedanza, mm -hmm. who has really taken this as a cause. And the steps that he's had to go through and the cities had to go through and the DPWs had to go through to get a priority list and we're still working on it. Mm -hmm. We just had a meeting on it. Right. And I've seen what, how much work goes into it. But he's had the people that have had to call and make a nuisance of themselves almost to say, hey, listen, we have to get this done. Mm -hmm. So it's important to get those priorities in the city done and get a list so that we can hand it to the DPW and say, listen, this is what our constituents have said. This has got to be our priority list. And on a few cases, it hasn't really matched up with their priority list. So now we're working on combining those two documents okay. and getting that done. So. Right, and just how frustrating. I've gotten the calls from constituents saying, like, my street's not being plowed or there's big potholes and finding out my street's not accepted. Well, it's a street. I've lived here for how many years? How did that happen? And to be able to learn from you all about what that process is and help kind of guide them into getting their streets accepted. I had, I had no idea just how crazy of a process it is and how involved and that there were streets in the city that just haven't been accepted and some, like, large streets that I wouldn't expect. Right.
and that's what, I, and I was surprised in some of the streets that I looked at in my own ward, and I'm saying, geez, they've been there forever. These streets have been there forever. Mm -hmm. But, and I don't think that the, the uh, property owners necessarily understand it. No, I don't think so. And there are some people in the city that have purchased a property without knowing that they're actually on an unaccepted street. Mm -hmm. So obviously that was a, an issue that happened. So now it's the process of cleaning up that gap, that legislation, so it's not happening from, from this point forward. Right. And I think that they've done a, a great job as far as, as sealing those gaps and saying, you know, this is done, this is not going to happen again. Mm -hmm. But now it's going back and processing what was allowed to happen in the past and fixing that. So, like I said, big learning curve for me. Yeah. Um, uh, Mark Bedanza has been fantastic as mm -hmm. far as sharing the process and the information. So now that we all know and we can all help to take those steps. Yeah, and so I know you're also really involved in the community with the Lemonster Deck Hockey Center. I spent a whole lot of my childhood watching my brother play games down there. Uh, what, what's coming up for them? Like, what's going on this season? Um, big time of year for us at, at the Deck Hockey Center. The registrations have started, so that's for the kids um, and the adults. Mm -hmm. So it's a matter of getting all the kids into register, getting the teams put together. We're encouraging the coaches because it, it goes... Once we get into registrations, we get into games really quickly. Every year we say we're going to try to start a little bit early so we're not playing when it's quite so cold. Mm -hmm. And as a child, I'm sure you remember the, the cold days standing out there. It was great. There. You got hot chocolate. You mixed yes. it with your, like, bubble gum. It was, it was an <laughs> awesome, awesome time. We have a great core of, it's all volunteer coaches. Mm -hmm. And these people, uh, they're, they're, a lot of them are just parents who jump in. Some of them coach two and three teams. They're phenomenal. Uh, the kids always want to go back to their coach. We have a great time with them. So yes, if you haven't registered your child yet, now is the time to get in there. It's weekends. We're there on the weekends from anywhere from about 10 to 4 o'clock and also during the week from about 2 o'clock to 8 o'clock at night. So get your kids in there, get your adult teams in there, get them registered and ready to go. That's awesome. Now if folks want to get in touch with the Lemonster Deck Hockey Center, how do they reach them? Um, obviously, you can Just go to mystreethockey.com, okay. yeah. LDHC. There's a number of, mm -hmm. if you go onto Google and you put Lemister Deck Hockey, you'll you're going to get one of the sites. Awesome. Uh, the phone number there is 978-537-6711. Uh, and anytime uh, you can make that phone call, we've sent out a lot of flyers to the schools. Mm -hmm. It's in the newspaper every day. Yeah. Uh, so it's a lot of, you'll see it out there. And for your constituents, how is the best way for them to get in touch with you if they're watching this and saying, hey, there's this issue I want to talk to Pauline about? Um, I actually have new cards that are being printed. Oh, so perfect. as I'm going out and, and meeting people, they'll have my new contacts, mm -hmm. obviously through the city's website. Um, my my um, home phone is 978-537-5021. That's the easiest way to get a hold of me. You're going to get an answering machine most days. If it's an emergency, my cell phone, 978-870-0365. And um, by email, on Facebook, I've had people that have been able to, to get a hold of me one way or another. So I actually have people stop by. They know where I live, mm -hmm. so they stop by the house, mm -hmm. uh, which is also always nice yeah, uh, yeah. to get to sit down and meet with them and, and, and have them on my home turf. And, um, so anyways, like I said, when, when the cards are ready and printed, mm -hmm. I expect to do some more walking out in, in the wards, be able to drop those off to people. That's awesome. Well, I'm so excited to get to work with you, and I'm so excited to see what you're going to do to kind of really empower Ward 2. So I thank you so much for joining me today. I can't thank you enough for having me and for all the work that you're doing, yeah, Natalie. Great. Pauline. So we're going to be coming back uh, to speak to former Senator Jen Flanagan. I don't think I'm ever going to get used to saying that. Uh, so thank you so much for tuning in and, and stick around after the break. Welcome back and huge thanks to Pauline Cormier, Ward 2 City Councilor, for joining us. And now we're joined by the new commissioner of the Cannabis Control Commission, oh. uh, Jen Flanagan. And it's, it's going to be a little bit of an adjustment to get used to saying that. I'm still just greet you, Senator. How Jen, are you doing? That's fine. <laughs> titles are just titles. <laughs> yeah. So I just want to thank you so much for all of your service. And when we booked this, you were still a senator. So it's a weird, it's a weird place for me. I was, to... I was a senator and with no plans to leave when we booked this. <laughs> So, yeah. 
but it's I know when an opportunity presents itself and what an amazing opportunity for you to bring all of your knowledge around mental health, around substance use, uh, to the Cannabis Control Commission and Governor Baker couldn't have made a better choice. And Thank I'm lucky you. that you're gonna still be my constituent going I forward. I'm not so. leaving. I don't know if there's some kind of, people keep asking if I'm moving. I'm not leaving, so. Well, people I, people say like that Still commute right. to Boston is really long, but you've I've been, been doing, doing it, it for 20 years. <laughs> <laughs> right. So it'll be fun. So so huge transitions. You just celebrated a birthday. Happy belated birthday. Thank you. And Thank you. so how has your how has your summer been? What are you excited about well, heading into this new endeavor? Um, the summer was supposed to be quiet. I had hoped to take some time off in August. Um, I was actually working. I went up to Vancouver to uh, research the safe injection sites for heroin. And we just had our hearing this week on that. I <coughs> yeah, would love the other to day. chat with you about that. Um, and then Governor Baker called and then a whirlwind ensued. So it was it was not what it was expected to be. Mm -hmm. August was a little bit busier than I thought it was going to be. But it's been good. It's been a different transition. It's really tough to leave the last 21 years but then be excited to embark on something new. So it's been bitter, very bittersweet. Mm -hmm. um, I think, well, you know, most people don't know, it was eight days of move out change things, get things in order. Uh, so it was kind of hectic, but it's it's been interesting. I'm excited. I think it's going to be a great, great opportunity for you to just use your skills in another way. I know you've been a phenomenal advocate for Lemonster and all of North Central Mass in your role yeah. as the senator, and I'm so sad to see you go. You're leaving such huge shoes. But I'm excited to be able to work with you in a new way and to yeah. have you continue to be a leader well, on the, issues you're really passionate about. The, the good thing is, is that I'm still going to be involved in boards and commissions that I've been on up here. Right. Um, I don't have to necessarily leave all that mm -hmm. behind, so I can still be part of the Shine Initiative. and. I'm on the board at the advisory board at Devereaux and I work with Perkins and so there's a lot of different things that I that I've been doing that I get to do but I think it's going to be really interesting to have the mental health and substance abuse background going into the regulation of the adult recreational use world um, because you know I voted no on the question I had a lot of concerns about how the question was written and people have translated that into I'm anti cannabis mm -hmm. um, so it's been it's been interesting to have those conversations but I'm looking forward to it well, and I think you're a part of a five-member board so, yes. commission, so there's a lot of voices, and it's going to be really interesting to see how you move forward. And this is a completely new industry, so what an amazing opportunity for you to kind yeah. of help shape this. I was in the governor's office when they were um, legalizing casinos and, and doing all of those compacts. So it was That just, was my bill. Yeah. <laughs> Right. I brought so casinos just, and now we're doing pot. <laughs> so, so, you're, so you're on the, the front of every, every new endeavor in the Commonwealth. Uh, but transitioning from the legislature, one of the things that we have talked about on representing Lemonster is kind of how can you be a better advocate? How can Lemonster get more involved in either local or state or federal issues after the November election? A lot of folks said, on all sides, I really want to get involved and I'm not sure how. How can I make my voice heard? Do you I, have any advice? I think just pay attention. Mm -hmm. um, you know, one of the um, most interesting things of being a state senator is that people assume that I'm a federal senator. And so I am not Senator Warren and I'm not Senator Markey. And mm -hmm. while I appreciate their positions, you know, in the news, it's very difficult because they'll say state Senate votes on mm -hmm. this or Senate votes on something. Mm -hmm. And I'll get calls saying, you know, why did you vote? And I didn't, you know? Right. So pay attention to the levels of government. See where you can involve yourself. Um, I'm a really, really big supporter of people who want to get involved for positive reasons mm -hmm. and not necessarily just protest and, and go against a right. certain cause. Um, find a way. We have to turn this tide of negativity into positivity. And I think that showing our kids, um, mm -hmm. long gone are the days of, of your parents and grandparents taking you with them to volunteer somewhere. Mm -hmm. And I know people are busy. And believe me, I, I'm just as busy as people. But I find it, it's important for me that my niece and my stepsons and my nephews, they understand the importance of being part of a community. So I think that's a really big, a really big piece of this. And um, especially now mm -hmm. when there's so much anger and so much anxiety surrounding any type of issue, mm -hmm. really take a step back and say, you know, how does this affect my community? Right. Not my state, not my country, but my one little community. Mm -hmm. And then let it grow from there. And I met you when I was a high school senior taking AP government, yes. <laughs> um, and you were really the inspiration for us bringing our um, Friday morning office hours to the high school. I actually went into my old AP government class when I got started, and they said, I know you're doing these morning office hours. Can you do them here? Right. We're already going to be here for class. It would be great if you could come here, and honestly, the rest of the Lemonster population isn't showing up to my office at 7 in the morning. To, to I wouldn't either. Me. It's a little early. So, um, but, but it's... 
It's a way great. to engage the kids. I mean, and I think that, you know, we don't pay enough attention to people who are going to be voters. Mm -hmm. You know, you're a high school senior. I mean, I was 17 when I graduated. I wasn't old enough to vote, but, you know, there's a lot of people who are 18 by the time they're graduating, mm -hmm. and you're still treating them as their children, but you're not giving them enough attention as they're, they're going to cast that vote. And, you know, the one thing I tell my older stepson who can, um, who can vote is pull the ballot. Mm -hmm. If you don't like the if you don't like the person on the ballot, you have the ability to blank them. Mm -hmm. You don't have to, but you pull that ballot because you can, and then right. we have the right to pull the ballot. Um, and for me, that's important: making the effort and making sure that it's 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 there. And empowering youth and mental health kind of came together when you were working with some Lemonster High School students, now graduates, that yes. are working on a mental health curriculum bill. And I'm really excited because you were able to get it through the Senate this session. Could you we talk did. a little bit about it? It was it was exciting. The kids had come to me way back, and I call them kids because they were they were high school kids, and they wanted to learn more about mental health. They felt mm -hmm. as though the health curriculum was not telling them enough about anxiety disorders or bipolar or um, depression or any of the things that people can suffer from early on, and they wanted to change the curriculum. And to their credit, they wrote a 700-page bill which is DESE qualifications, mm -hmm. um, all parts of it. And we were finally able to get it through the Senate. And I think part of it is because we allowed it as an option. Mm -hmm. We're not mandating this to every school. We understand that not every school can afford it. But there are some schools that are very progressive in the fact that they'll talk about mental health just as easily as they'll talk about, about smoking and t tobacco. Um, and so it was really good because the girls were there, which I felt bad because it took a while for, mm -hmm. for us to get this done. And the, it, our debate wasn't in the real chamber. Mm -hmm. We're in Gardner Auditorium, so um, it was just amazing to see people support it, and I, and I think that it was really important for them to see the legislators yeah. were supporting it in the Senate. So my hope um, is that they've done their homework this summer because they know they have to go on to the House and do their job and get it done in the House. Yeah, and we already met with them, and I'm so excited. They're just <coughs> they're blowing me away with their professionalism and just their knowledge about this issue. And I think it's so important that our kids learn about mental health and can be better support systems for their family members and loved ones that maybe have a mental health diagnosis or um, maybe want to get involved and, and become a social worker, become a mental health professional because yeah. we need so many of those, particularly out here in North Central Massachusetts. Yeah. Every day I hear about people who are on wait lists trying to get support um, when they're in crisis. You know, and we're trying to fix that too. Representative Jeff Roy from Franklin has mm -hmm. a bill that we would be able to um, pay off some of the loans or we defer some of the loans for people who go into this field because I really think the pay scale is what prevents people from going into the social work field or the mental health and behavioral mm -hmm. health realm. Um, you're not going to come out of a four-year school with thirty, forty thousand dollars 40000 in debt and then you're going to make $25,000 or $30,000 a year. You just can't do it. Right. So it's good because with the students wanting to learn more about mental health, with the representatives having bills to try to help people get into the field, I think it all comes together. And that's really the best part of government, right? Is that mm. we, you take an idea, you do something with it, and then all of a sudden it blossoms into this big thing. Mental health is becoming so mainstream for everybody. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it's like talking about someone who has a heart disease. Right. It, it's just there, and it's okay. Um, and I think it's really good for kids, even younger kids, to understand you ha you're just a little different. It doesn't matter. I mean, you're still a person. You're still going to have the quality of life. You're still going to play ball in the, in the mm -hmm. yard. You're still going to do whatever you want. Um, but you also have to pay attention to your health. Yeah. Uh, and it just it frustrates me when people compartmentalize mental health versus medical health or mm -hmm. physical health. Mm -hmm. To me, it's just whole health. So. Yeah, and this has been something that I have been just so passionate about with my work with rape crisis centers and supporting trauma survivors and just trying to figure out how do we talk about it. And I worked exclusively with teens. You worked oh, yeah. with young people. Uh, it's really hard navigating just being a teen tends to be hard, like getting through middle school and high school, but then throw on a mental health disorder. Like that makes it that much harder. Mm -hmm. And how do you build that support system and make sure people have the right language to talk about, that we're reducing as much of the stigma as possible so that folks can seek help and feel comfortable talking about it. And I think mm -hmm. once we bring it into the light and realize there's a whole lot of people kind of struggling in silence, we're gonna be in a much better place. The funny thing is I think the kids are okay. Yeah. I think children are okay. Mm -hmm. It's when they start to realize that the parents might be uncomfortable mm -hmm. is when that they start to be uncomfortable. Right. Um, because when you're young, you have no idea. I can tell you, you have bipolar, and you'll be like, okay, you know, what yeah. is that? Yeah. It's not until you start to really physically notice. And um, you know, I always say with the girls that I worked with um, in Worcester and Grafton, 
it's hard enough to be a teenage girl. You throw a diagnosis on top and you expect them to just cope. Mm -hmm. They need a lot of support systems because it's the foundation to get them to adulthood. Yeah. And that not that what our job is to get people, you know, moving? So I think that it's going to be great. Um, I'm proud of the, the kids. It was used to be called Teens Leading the Way. Mm -hmm. And I'm really proud of them. And um, I can't wait till their bill gets to the governor's office. Um, you know, hopefully I can put a bug in his ear and say, hey. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm just so excited to work on this and to educate the other members of the House about how important and I think yeah. there is this culture and where you made it optional that folks can opt in. This is a great resource that we can yeah. add one more piece of the toolkit for our, for our schools to be able to fully support all parts of our students. And that's the big thing. Not every school is the same. Mm -hmm. You know, there are some schools that are doing a great job now. There are some schools that are awful right now when it comes to this. Um, and it is what it is. You have to just say what, you know, don't sugarcoat it. Don't say, oh, we're trying. No, you, there are some that are great. Um, and I think this gives them another tool, like you said, to just be able to bring in. But I think the biggest piece for this is that the students are asking. Mm -hmm. This is not some mandate put on by government to say, hey, you know, make sure you have more mental health. These students are saying, we didn't get enough, mm -hmm. and we want to support our friends, and we want to understand. Um, there's nothing worse to me than sending a child to college without fully understanding the diagnosis that they have or feeling as though they have to mm -hmm. hide it um, because you're putting them into this really big world yeah. without sort of the incubator they had at home. So to me, high school is the perfect place. No, I, I'm so excited about that. And so I have always followed you on social media and seen what you're up to. Are <laughs> it's you been be quiet lately. <laughs> are you going to be? Are you going to be kind of keeping that up as you head into the commission? And like, how are people going to be able to pay attention to what's going on and what are you doing? Are you going to still have that kind of personal? Well, like, first of all, I, I can imagine that the criticism I'm about to live under and the scrutiny <laughs> is going to be tenfold to what I lived under as a senator. You're, so I'm you're sure, a tough lady. I'm, I'm sure the headlines sure will tell you what we're it. doing. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm we're gonna I'm gonna do it as much as I can. Yeah. Um, you know, right now we're literally building it from. Mm -hmm. We mm -hmm. just got desks, not even mm -hmm. offices, but desks. Right. Um, there's no permanent place for us to be mm -hmm. yet, and um, right th now I come under the open meeting law, so mm -hmm. I have to try and navigate that world. So right. I will do, I'll do it as much as possible, but I think um, I have a feeling that every time we meet, everybody will know. Right. Right. Uh, so, it, but it'll be interesting. I'm excited to see what happens. Well, I'm so excited to watch how this plays out, and I'm so excited that Lemonster gets to have a really strong voice, and that it's yours uh, in a part of this conversation. And I think it's great for North Central Mass to have people yeah. from from out here participating and, and being a part of this conversation. So, thank you so much for joining yeah. me, and I'm so excited to continue to see kind of where you head. Congratulations. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. So, thank you for tuning in. Thank you for. Oh, am I on this one? <laughs> Thank you for tuning in today. Um, we're actually, because the senator has left and there's an open seat, we're going to be turning the next two episodes into a chance for you to meet the candidates, first for the primary election and then for the general election. So we're still finalizing the details, um, but it's going to be a longer segment, and you're going to get a chance to, to kind of meet the candidates and, and make really great informed decisions. So thank you so much for tuning in to Representing Lemonster, and please reach out with any questions that you have. My contact information is going to show up on the screen right after this. Thank you.